Let's look to the Lord again in prayer. Father in heaven, we humble ourselves as we come before the throne of grace, seeking forgiveness, Lord, for all that we have done that has gone against you. Lord, we, we do fall. We are grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to confess our sins, to repent of them, dear Lord, and knowing that the path that you have prepared for us is still awaiting, and we are grateful that we can get back on it, Lord, and do the things which, much, which must be done. We're grateful, Lord, that you have called us with the high calling of sharing the gospel message with those who are lost. Help us, Lord, to recognize the opportunities that you send our way. Give us godly wisdom and discernment, dear Lord, that we might show compassion as we come alongside others and tell them what it is you have done for us in our lives. Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity to, to plant a seed, to water it that it might take root, or perhaps to even see fruit. But Lord, we know that we are called always to be sharing this wonderful, life-saving, life-changing message of the gospel of Christ. Use us as you see fit, Lord, that your will might be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray for all who are here today. I thank you for each and every one. They all come with some need on their heart, some some desire, or simply because they know someone who has a need or a desire. And Lord, we want to lift them up to you. You are the great physician, Lord. You can heal all that is wrong with us. And we are grateful and thankful again for the avenue of prayer that was open to us when Jesus died on the cross and the, the uh, curtain in the temple was torn in two, giving us access directly to you in the Holy of Holies, dear Lord. And we are thankful that we can come to you now and confess our sins and to lift up one another, Lord. We have many people each week that we listen in our bulletin that we pray for. There are so many others of whom we are not aware, but you know their names, Lord. And we just pray that you would be merciful to them. I pray especially for Jane and her, and her dad, Jean, dear Lord, uh, both who know you, and uh, for that I am eternally grateful. Jean apparently is uh, nearing the end of his life here on earth, dear Lord, and I would just pray that you would uh, give him and his daughter both the, the peace, uh, the comfort, dear Lord, uh, the encouragement that only you can give in a time such as this. I pray also for Kristen, uh, dear Lord, who is, who is dealing with terminal cancer, Lord. I just pray that she would uh, come to know you if she doesn't, and that you would give her comfort, Lord, in her final days on earth. Lord, none of us is promised tomorrow, so none of us knows if we'll be here tomorrow or not. I pray that we are all walking closely with you every day, and that we would just lay our concerns and our cares before your throne, Father. I thank you, Lord, for the missionaries. I thank you especially for the Ricker family who is here with us today and the service that they have provided in Latin America and in South America over so many years. I thank you, Lord, that you've brought them to us today and that you would continue to Keep your hedge about them as they continue their travels while they're here in the United States, that you would uh, bless them uh, with their ability to reach so many others, dear Lord. Again, all that they've done in the Lord's name, we are grateful to have them with us. All the missionaries, Lord, the ones that we know, the ones that we don't know, we know your people are on the front lines around the world. Um, they are facing severe persecution in many cases. Some may even be martyred today. And Lord, I pray that, uh, that your arms are wrapped tightly around them. Keep them 
Keep them encouraged up to the final moment, Lord, and then they will see their reward in heaven above. So, Father, we are grateful. Those of us who are not on the field, we are grateful that we can pray for them. We can support them with our resources. Dear Lord, we are grateful that you would use us in that way. I pray for our uh, our nation's military that is still scattered in different parts of the world. I pray for their safety and their safe return back home, Lord. Uh, bless our country. It remains divided, Lord. We have turned from you. We have done so many things the wrong way. Lord, we, we who are trusting in you and you alone uh, ask you to forgive this nation. Lord, for the sake of the righteous, I pray that you continue to have mercy on us, Lord, that you would continue to use those of us who know you to stand up and speak. Christians have been sitting too long. We need to make some noise. We need to let people know that there's a God in heaven, a God who will judge all of this, and that because we know the way, Lord, we are, we are here more than happy to express that, to explain it to whoever wants to know. Lord, give us the boldness and the courage to say the things that we need to, to say on your behalf. Bless our service, Lord. Bless our luncheon afterwards. Our time with, uh, with the Ricker family as they bring us up to date on what's going on in Guatemala. Uh, again, Lord, we are a blessed people. We're a blessed family of believers here today. And uh, we thank you for that. We ask it all in Christ's precious name. Amen. I have a couple of announcements, and then I'd like to ask Hal and Stephen to come up just for a few minutes to say hello to you all. Um, any visitors today? I don't see anyone brand new, so if I've overlooked you, make sure you get me on the way out. But uh, good to see everyone in here today. Uh, as I said a few times already, we're glad to have uh, Hal and Stephen and Juanita and Samuel and Joshua with us as well. Uh, what a blessing uh, they have been to uh, Gail and Mrs. Decker and myself and several others of you who have gotten to know them over the years. And um, again, it's, it's good to see them in person. We will have our luncheon after the service. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of sneaking in the kitchen on occasion between Sunday school and church, so there seems to be quite a bit of food coming in. So please join us. Everyone is welcome. The Lord always provides a bounty, and uh, we'll have a good time of food and fellowship as well. We have a session meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m. Any questions or concerns anyone has, please see me or one of the elders uh, prior to that. Good Friday is this coming Friday. We will have a service at 7 p.m. We will also celebrate the Lord's Supper during that time as well. Uh, Saturday, as you see in the bulletin, April 23rd, that'll be here, what, two weeks from yesterday, I guess. Uh, our next giveaway day out in the, in the yard at 10 a.m. See Gail if you would like to reserve a table. New member Sunday again on May the 1st, and our spring cleanup on May 7th, Saturday, May 7th at 9 a.m. So I think... Did I miss anything, gentlemen? No. Look good. Okay. Brother Hal and Brother Stephen, if you could uh, come up and just say a few words to the folks. It's a joy to be with you on this happy day of the triumphant entrance of Jesus Christ our Lord into Jerusalem. And we're going to read greetings from our churches in Guatemala. Because at this time they're singing, celebrating the triumphant entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. They're singing and praying and teaching one another that it's wonderful to give praises to God, praises to Jesus Christ, our wonderful Savior. He's the God man, the man God. He's the one that came to earth to save us. 
So first of all, we want to tell you about uh, the greetings that we'll bring from our two churches in Guatemala and the third church of the CF. Now, the CF is the Confederation of Evangelical Fundamental Churches of Guatemala. So we praise God for the men. Some of them are Presbyterians, some are Baptists, some are Independents, and therefore the defense of the faith. So they would like to send their greetings to you folks here at the church. Uh, the church uh, is in Chimaltenango as well, and on that church, it's uh, the church where the deacon was shot in the barber shop, and where he had a bullet wound that wouldn't heal. He's had three operations. It looks now he will not have the fourth operation because a thin, uh, you might say, a thin skin is now growing over the bullet wound near the spine. So greetings from other churches in Guatemala that love the Lord and want to praise the Lord. Some are independent, some are Baptist, some are Presbyterian, and they're going ahead. And the CF, of course, is to defend the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Missionaries have to preach the gospel, the one and only gospel. Then they also have to defend the faith. So we would like to read readings from our small uh, institute, Bible Institute. During the epidemic, of course, we know that it was shut down, but it's opened up again. So we'll bring greetings from our small uh, Bible Institute. And last of all, we will bring greetings from our Trinitarian Bible Society of Guatemala. Now, the Trinitarian Bible Society helps all the groups that I mentioned. <laughs> they help the Bible Institute. They help our two churches. They help the CF Church. They help the men uh, preachers from our uh, CF, uh, the Confederation of Evangelical Fundamental Churches. So with all these greetings, <laughs> I would ask for your prayers uh, that we can continue to preach the gospel in Guatemala and continue to defend the faith. Stephen has other greetings now, so he can pass on the word. Muy buenos días, amados hermanos en Cristo Jesús. Es un gozo estar aquí con ustedes en esta mañana. Did anybody understand me? <laughs> okay. Well, Pastor said, give him a little Spanish. Confuse him a little bit, you know. <laughs> but I said, good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's uh, truly a joy to be with you here this morning to worship together with you. And it's good to be here in the home base of defense of the truth the truth of the Word of God. And so we rejoice with you here this morning, and we will always keep you in our thoughts and prayers as we go back to Guatemala, and we ask you to also pray for us. You know, together today, we are missionaries. We are working in Guatemala, but I think those of you who stay here in the United States are now part of the biggest mission field in the world. People need the Lord and people need to be saved and they're going to be they're going to get saved by the word of God which is the power of God unto salvation. So as we go forth, remember, we're all servants of Jesus Christ and he has a mission for us all to fulfill. So we'll be speaking about the uh, mission field in Guatemala later on this morning after the luncheon, and we look forward to having fellowship with all of you today. May the Lord bless you. Thank you. We look forward to hearing more, obviously, when we get down stairs later on. Please stand for the scripture reading. Reverend Ra is going to read Matthew 21, 28, and 32. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise. 
And he answered and said, I go, sir. And he went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father. They say unto him, the first Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Please be seated. Now to pastor's message, examine yourself. Thank you, Pastor Ron, for the reading. And again, for the beautiful music we had today. Just want to take a few moments before we finish our service. You know, we quite often talk about taking advantage of certain Christian holidays. And what I mean by that is we use them to tell others about the Lord. Sometimes it's a little easier to speak about Jesus when his name is in the public square. And we see through our text today that Jesus was doing the same thing. Today, Palm Sunday, of course, the day in which our Lord rode into Jerusalem. He was not on a conquering white stallion like many had hoped he would be, but he was on an unpretentious donkey, lowly in stature and humble in nature. And we know quite a bit about the crowds that came out that day to greet him as well and how they prepared a path of palms for him. And if you didn't pick one up on the way in, make sure you get one on the way out. They prepared this path for him uh, upon his entrance into Jerusalem. Many people who were there were indeed his true followers, just as many who were there were his true enemies. But the majority, as is often the case, who showed up that day were just yearning for someone finally to enter onto the scene and overthrow the oppression of the Roman Empire. So if Jesus was willing to be their king, they were more than willing to crown him. But as we all know, those of us in here, that was not his purpose. Not at that time. He will one day return, won't he? He will return as the Lion of Judah. But on that first Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago, his entrance was as the Lamb of God. Throughout the first part of that week, up until the Last Supper, which he shared with his disciples on Thursday night, he spoke to many people along the way. And as was his way, he spoke often in parables. But in so doing, he succeeded in convicting them. He convicted them, and this, of course, was what he was aiming to do. He convicted them to the point of separating the wheat from the chaff. And as the week went on, it became more and more apparent that that is exactly what was happening. People were being forced by what Jesus was saying to examine themselves as they considered who this man Jesus really was. And as they did so, it became apparent that the city was filled with far more chaff than it was wheat. 2,000 years later, nothing's changed. We, we say that a lot, don't we? And because narrow is the way which leads to life, and broad is the way which leads to destruction, those cries that started out on Palm Sunday as Hosanna soon turned to crucify him. So I want to look, I want to take a closer look at one of the parables which Pastor Ron read for us, which Jesus used to reveal himself. 
revealing himself to those who were gathered there in Jerusalem at that time, trying to figure out just who he was. Maybe you know somebody today who is trying to figure out who Jesus is. Maybe somebody in here is still working on that. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of religions that will tell you, and you've heard all of these descriptions, great teacher, great prophet, great humanitarian, just about anything nice that you want to say about him, you will find somebody somewhere who is willing to say that. But often it's the case that they stop short of saying he is God. Then you'll find scores of people out there who will say, sure, he's God. They'll tell you that, but they won't really believe it. You can find out more about what a person believes by how they act, not by what they say. How many husbands and wives tell each other that they love each other, and then they go out and have an affair? If you believe the statistics, it happens quite a bit. So what people say and what people do can sometimes be two completely different things. People have gotten really good at fooling one another. But you can't fool God. Stop trying. You can't pull one over on the one who made you. He knows what you think before you even think it, much less what you say and do. So there's no fooling him. The only fool in that equation would be you for even trying to do that. Jesus knows if you're trusting him or not. He knows the wheat from the tares. We can't figure that out. During the days of the Roman Empire, it was rather easy to tell who the believers were and who they weren't. Amphitheaters and coliseums were filled to capacity with unbelievers. The believer, the Christian, was the guy in the arena trying to stay one step ahead of the hungry lion. The unbelievers went out at night back then. They went out to their decadent parties filled with licentiousness and sin, while the believers were dipped in oil and then impaled on poles and set on fire to light the streets so the party goers could find their way. It was easy to tell who the Christians were and who the unbelievers were. Much easier to tell the wheat from the chaff. But today, it's much more difficult. Being a Christian has come to mean different things to different people. Have you ever noticed how many people, men and women alike, wear a cross around their neck? Do you really think they're all believers? I'm not here judging any of them, but some of these folks I see on, on TV coming out of Hollywood or out of a ballpark or wherever the case may be, the big shiny cross dangling around their neck, and then you hear some of the things they say, you read about some of the things they do, they need to take that cross off. It's the same with churches. Many are filled with a mixture, a mixture of contenders, those contending for the faith, and pretenders. It's my fervent hope that everyone in here today is trusting in Christ alone for their salvation. But only God knows for sure. Again, we're all sinners. You can't get into heaven with sin wrapped around you. That sin has to be forgiven. And there's only one way for that to happen. The shed blood of Christ was given 
for the forgiveness of sins. So you either believe that or you don't. And if you do believe it, please confess your sins. Ask God to forgive you and then repent. Turn from your evil ways. Scripture tells us he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please don't leave here this morning without knowing that you're one of his. We know there was a traitor among the disciples, but who beside Jesus knew who it was? I'm sure when he spoke about it at the Last Supper, there were probably 11 others in there wondering, I don't think it's me, I wonder if it's the guy next to me. How many actually had an idea? I can't attempt to make the separation of chaff from wheat. And I think at this hour in history, it is a task that even the angels would have trouble performing. But one day, one day at the master's bidding, the harvest will come. And first the tares will be gathered together into bundles to burn. And then afterwards, the wheat will be gathered and taken into Jehovah's barn. Until then, though, we find ourselves here together, growing together. You can't tell a wheat from a tear. But we're all mixed in as one. And it will stay that way until the harvest. So again, I implore you today, as Jesus was doing that week leading up to his crucifixion, to examine yourself. Don't worry about the guy sitting next to you. Examine yourself to see whether or not you are in the faith. Please, don't anybody take for granted that you're a Christian just because you're sitting in church. Sitting in church doesn't make you any more Christian than sitting in a garage makes you a car. It's that simple. They used to say that sitting in a barn makes you a horse, but we have moved on from horses and buggies. Not all of us, Linda. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We're not here to judge each other. Please remember that. But let everyone who is here today judge themselves. I can't stress the importance of that. Just as we have two types in church today, the parable that Pastor Ron read for us also represents two different types of people. There are those who prove to be better than what they promised to be, and then there are those whose promises are better than what they actually turn out to be. The man in our text had two sons, which means both of those boys had the same father. Just as God is one over all of mankind, and as such, we all receive similar provision from him. He makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, he sends to rain on the just and the unjust, Jesus told us in Matthew 5, 45. But just like the two sons that we read about in our text today, there's vast differences in the character of mankind. Both of these young men that Ron read about were given the same command. Go work in my vineyard. But the conduct of each of them was very different, wasn't it? One of the sons actually did better than what he said he would. He proved better than the promise. His answer was bad, but his actions turned out to be good. His answer to his father's request was a flat, No, I will not. I will not go out to work in that vineyard. Someone once said, excuses are bad, but denials are worse. It's often the same response Christian people 
give to God when he reminds them of the call which we have been given. And if you're a believer, we've all been given the same call to spread the gospel. The earth is God's vineyard, and we have been called by him to work in it. That's a high calling. can't tell you how, how high a calling that is to come from the throne room of God and be his messengers. Plow the fields, plant the seeds, water those seeds which have been planted so that they can take root. And finally, when the time is right, harvest the fruit. Isn't that what the Great Commission means? To go therefore and teach all nations? We can plant the seeds of faith in foreign soil by supporting missionaries like the Ricker family who are with us today. Or we can till the ground right here at home. What do we say? Around the world or around the block. You don't have to go far to find someone who needs to hear the gospel. Amen? They're out there. Scores of them are out there. Might not even have to leave your own house. Either way, again, we've been called with a high calling because it's God's chosen method. He could have used angels. He used the angel to come down, um, Gabriel, and make the announcement to Mary and Joseph about the birth of Christ. Came to the shepherds in the field. The angels can do that, but he chose us instead. He chose redeemed sinners to reach out to lost sinners, just as every one of you in here probably had someone reach out to you before you placed your faith and trust in Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul told us that in Romans 10, 17. But some Christians say, no, I won't do that. Others really give a similar answer, but in maybe a little more creative way. It's not that I won't do it, God. It's just that I can't. Not right now, anyway. You see, I'm working. I have two jobs. The baby's sick. The lawn always needs to be cut. You know, I, if you've noticed, I, I get the hiccups when I talk to strangers. So I can't do it today, Lord. I just can't. Not today. But maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. <clears throat> Tomorrow never comes, does it? Tomorrow becomes today. We start with the excuses again. Some people see sharing the gospel as work. And they're much too comfortable to get involved with any of that. See, they're, they're in a rut. And it's a very comfortable rut. Some folks are just flat out lazy. Some people just despise work. And I've noticed with some of those types of people, they often end up working harder to stay out of work than they would if they had just done the job to begin with. Maybe you know somebody like that. It just seems like I know them all, but I'm sure you all know a few of them. But it's certain that they're becoming more and more prevalent in our society today. I don't think there's any question about that. And by that happening, it will ultimately be to our peril. Because they're seeking their own will above the Lord's. And there is no blessing in that. Other Christians, unfortunately, we find out, are more in love with the business of the world more so than they are with the business of the Lord. Well, just think for a moment. What has eternal implications? Let's think on things eternal, on things above. Everything out there will go up in flames one day. And so whether they're pleasing their own senses or whether they are doing someone else's bidding, they're kept from doing the great work that the Lord has given us to do. Now, 
I would not think for a minute of standing up here and telling you that I have pursued all of the opportunities that God has given me. I haven't. I've missed far too many of them. When I stand before Christ's judgment seat, as all believers will, I'll have a long list of excuses, and they'll all go up in smoke. But I can tell you that during those times when I was obedient, I received blessings from heaven that are indescribable. And I say they're indescribable because I can't possibly describe them to you because God prepared them for me, just as he has prepared blessings that are particular to each of you that you won't be able to describe to others. They're yours. They were meant for you. But you'll never experience them if you don't go to work. What did Paul say about work? You don't work, you don't eat. That kind of takes it right where it needs to be, doesn't it? Don't do God's work, and you won't taste the manna that only comes to you from heaven. God's blessings, I have to tell you, are out of this world. Literally. Taste them. Experience them. And if you do, I can guarantee you that you will go back for more. And so, perhaps this is where repentance comes in. We're told at the end of verse 30 that afterward the son repented and went out into the vineyard. There are many in heaven today, and some still abiding here on earth, who in the beginning were evil, wicked, obstinate people, very unpromising. But after repenting, they came to be something. Some of the finest, most effective Christians that we read about suffered under the excesses of riotous living before they answered, God's call and came home. Such was the prodigal son. Such were some of you. Such was I at one time. Paul told the believers in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6 11, there's just so many of us who do so many things that we regret. But don't get caught up in the guilt of all of that. Repent of your sins. He will cleanse you. He will make you whole again. Christianity is indeed the, the faith of second chances and third and fourth and fifth and on and on and on. As long as you're awake and moving, you can change from what you were. The greatest proof of the new birth is a changed life. And here we see in Jesus' parable the happy change of the first son's mind. You might say better late than never. That's fine. The only evidence of our repentance to our former resistance is to comply with that which we have been asked to do. And when we set ourselves to work, and it's been done, we'll be pardoned, and we'll be well. Jesus was very clear about that in the answer he gave in verse 31 of our text. Publicans and harlots, once they repent and do the will of their Father, will enter into the kingdom of God. You see, our Father in heaven is a kind Father. We, as his children, can see him that way. There are people out there who don't understand the father-child relationship. They see him only as a judge who is ready to stomp them out of existence. We see him in a much different, a much better light. He doesn't resent the affront of our refusals. refusals. He could, though. He could say, that's it, I'm done with you. 
But he doesn't. The son that told his father no deserved to be put out, maybe even disinherited. But our God, remember, is a gracious God, giving us those things that we don't deserve, notwithstanding our former mistakes. If we repent, he will favorably accept us. Blessed be our God that we are under a covenant that leaves room for such a thing as repentance. The thief on the cross, perfect example of this. He said no to God his entire life, didn't he? He kept running away from God until God nailed him to a tree. That got his attention. And then in the last hour of his life, he repented and believed. And where was God? He was waiting for him with open arms. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Greatest words anyone could hear, aren't they? God didn't resent the thief on the cross. He was glad to have him come home. The other son in our text didn't practice what he preached. His answer was good, but his, answer, his uh, actions were not. He failed in his performance. He went not, we are told in the parable. Saying and doing are two different things. Some might call that lying. Many speak lovingly with their mouth, but their heart is off in another direction. They may have initially had good intentions, but those plans are often waylaid when something else gets our attention. The world and the devil out there are always trying to get your attention to pull you away from the Lord's work. And when it comes to matters of the Lord, if you don't have a commitment that is focused, the devil will use his powers of persuasion and deception to lead you astray. It happens all the time. The bottom line is that their original purpose in a matter becomes no purpose at all. Buds and blossoms on a tree are not fruit. There's plenty of buds and blossoms right now on the trees, aren't there? No fruit yet. No fruit yet. And so with this as background, Jesus asks a question in verse 31 that seems simple on the surface, but when he answers it at the end of the verse, I'm sure it was convicting to many. Which of the two did the will of his father? The correct answer, of course, was the first brother. And Jesus agreed, saying evil men and prostitutes will get into the kingdom before the unrepentant will. And he told them why in verse 32. John the Baptist told you to repent and turn to God, and you wouldn't do it. Yet the evil people did. And even when you saw this happening, Jesus told them, you refused to repent. And so you couldn't believe. We just got finished on Wednesday nights a couple of weeks ago with our end times Bible study. And the part of it that just continues to make me scratch my head is all these people who refuse to repent. All these terrible plagues are poured out upon the world and their hearts just keep getting harder and harder. That repentance is not even in their vocabulary. It's so hard to believe, but then again, it really isn't. If you know how the Lord works, God draws us to him. Otherwise, we'd all be running 100 miles an hour in the opposite direction. What Jesus is saying here is that if the sinner turns from his wickedness, he shall be pardoned. And if the righteous man turns from his righteousness, he shall be rejected. 
So again, he's telling them, examine yourself. So you know I'm not letting you out of here until I ask you the question, where do you stand? People have to look within themselves. Sometimes it's a hard decision, isn't it? To look inside and be honest with yourself. People don't change easily. They don't want to give up what has been working for them all of their, the years of their life, even if it's in conflict with what God wants. People are so comfortable in the here and now that they can't see beyond their own shadow. The truth of the matter is that they're so comfortable with their own sin that it has twisted the truth of God. But again, no surprise here, that's what the devil does. He mixes just enough truth and error together to make people think they don't need the Lord. For sure, they don't need the Lord telling them how to live their lives. Sin's comfortable. Sin feels good. If it didn't, we wouldn't do it, would we? But because the lost live in the here and now and don't even think about the internal implications upon their lives, they reject the very God who holds the stopwatch on all of their narcissistic behaviors. When time is up, it's up. There's no negotiating at that point. When it's your time to go, you're going. The people in Jerusalem that week were without excuse. They knew the Bible. They knew the Hebrew scriptures. They knew what Moses and the prophets had told them. Ezekiel clearly said in Ezekiel 18, 21 through 24, if a wicked person turns away from all his sins and begins to obey God's laws and does what is just and right, then he shall live and not die. All his past sins will be forgotten and he shall live because of his goodness. Do you think I like to see the wicked die, says the Lord? Of course not. I only want him to turn from his wicked ways and live. However, if a righteous person turns to sinning and acts like any other sinner out there, should he be allowed to live? No, of course not. All his previous goodness will be forgotten and he will die in his sins. So Jesus convicted many in Jerusalem with those words. And many of those people, when they were discovering who he really was, what did they do? They turned on him. The cries of Hosanna that he heard when he was entering the city on Palm Sunday quickly turned to shouts of crucify him, crucify him as the week wore on. Just like Judas, they were children of the devil. How many Judases are there today in the body of Christ? The church needs to examine itself too. How many, if Jesus were to walk among us today, how many would send him back to the cross? Jesus is still convicting people, but he came to earth with a purpose, and that purpose was to redeem sinners. And he completed his mission. He said from the cross, it is finished. And now he is asking us to do the same. Are you a true follower? Are you contending for the faith? Or are you following your own selfish desires while pretending to be a believer? Examine yourself. Please examine yourself. Every one of us looks in the mirror every morning. Please examine yourself. Which one are you? I can't tell. All I can do is examine the fruit on your tree. But God knows. 
And I pray that he shakes us to the very core of our being so that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt who it is we're following. Because just as the cross stood before Jesus, we're going to have to bear our crosses as well. The way to glory may not be easy, but it will be rewarding. As long as you put your faith and your trust in the one who knows the way. Don't be like the second brother in our text. Don't fool yourself into thinking that way because you can't fool God. Father in heaven, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for the lessons that our Lord taught while he was here. Lord, I would plead with everyone here, myself included, to examine ourselves every day. Make sure we are following you, dear Lord. Make sure that we're on the path you prepared for us and not the one that we think is so great. Lord, as Jesus said in the garden, not my will, but thine be done. Bless us, Father. Bless us this week. Again, have us recognize any opportunity that presents itself to us where we might compassionately come alongside someone who is hurting and let them know just what it was you have done for us, Lord, that we might maybe even lead them here to church on Friday as we remember what happened that fateful day. And then again on Sunday, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Bless us this week, Lord. Bless all who are here. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.